While you're finding your seats and getting back to your, getting your Bibles out, I'm going to connect, hopefully. Talking about soldiers in a military community is always a tricky thing. I, I haven't, I don't usually preach uh, sermons that connect to the military because my impression has been that you get enough military talk outside of church, and so when you come to church, you're more than happy to leave the military talk uh, on base. So I try not to like use military illustrations a lot and things like that, um, but it just feels like, uh, well, Paul uses a military illustration, so I felt like, okay, I'll, I'll stick with Paul and, and scripture on this one, and we'll go with it. Um, so this, the heading of the, the title of the sermon is Soldiers at Their Worst and at Their Best. Um, which is also a tricky thing to talk about. Um, there are some people who will talk about the military and soldiers, and again, let me just apologize to any airmen, marines, or sailors. Um, I understand that you're not all soldiers. I'm just going to use that generically, and uh, I understand that's mildly offensive to some people. Um, there are some people who will talk about people in the military as if they can't do anything else, and they're uneducated and unintelligent, and so then you just go into the military. And, and rightly so, that is uh, blasted and attacked. Um, but if, if we can be honest for a second, there's also kind of the other extreme, where it's like, if you're in the military, you do nothing wrong. You're just, our soldiers are perfect. They're wonderful uh, men and women who deserve nothing but adoration and respect. And Kind of from the outside, you might kind of have that view of the military, but as you get close and work with the military, you understand, we understand, we can be honest with each other, right? It's a, it's a mixed bag. You've got fantastic soldiers, and you've got um, less than fantastic soldiers. You, you have seen soldiers at their best, doing things that, that make you want to stand up and applaud and say, this is what America is all about. And you've seen soldiers at their worst, doing things that you want to hide your face and say, man, I, I hope I am in no way associated with that person. Um, so instead of me saying things, decrying, or, or let's, let's do a little exercise together, OK? We're going to say, at their best, soldiers are, and I, one word. Um, one word descriptions from you. At their best, soldiers are selfless, I heard. Honorable. Heroic. Brave. Humble. Faithful. Strong. It's a good picture, isn't it? Brave, did somebody say? Yes. You said brave. <laughs> Sacrificial. Sacrificial. To the point of death, even. This one might be a little harder. At their worst, soldiers are. <laughs> Maybe it's not so hard. <laughs> Lazy. Human. Cowardly. Malicious. <laughs> you got to slow down. <laughs> I got forgetful. Authority what? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I've heard. <laughs> Authority abusers. Self-centered. Instead of self-sacrificial. Do you know what's really neat is that soldiers haven't changed for 2,000 years. It's, it's interesting that you know, societies change and technology changes, but the human heart and the human soul is still very much the same as, so we've got a, you know, a picture of a Roman armor. When Paul uses a, a military analogy, that's probably what comes to everyone's mind. The Roman army was the army that was omnipresent uh, in his world, in the world of the people he was writing to. When he talks about soldiers, 
That's the picture that his readers would picture is the Roman soldier. Um, and the Roman soldier, you can read through histories, and was incredibly noble, was incredibly uh, followed orders. They had strategy and tactics that defeated most, many of their enemies time after time at their best. And the Roman soldier, similar to the American soldier, also had their times where they were at their worst, where they would pillage, where they would take, where they would rob, where they would rape, where they would kill. Uh, I'm not comparing all of that to American soldiers. So, uh, so he uses this analogy of soldiers. Turn to Romans 13. And it's almost like he says, I want you to be like soldiers, but I want you to be like soldiers at their best and not soldiers at their worst. We're going to look specifically at um, the end of the passage there. Let's start at verse 11. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. And he's using this kind of as a dichotomy. The night and the darkness are soldiers at their worst. The day and the light is soldiers at their best. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, traditionally, throughout history, whenever you get a lot of people, and, and traditionally, certainly, uh, armies were almost, cert were almost completely men, you get a lot of men together, you train them to be strong and to kill and to have weapons, and then you put all of these men together and you give them all weapons. You have this incredible, powerful tool at your disposal, but you also have this incredible, dangerous dynamic because you've got a lot of men who are trained to use weapons, who are standing around, and if they're not fighting, then they're wondering, what should we do? And so soldiers at their worst are ruled by their impulses. They're ruled by, I want, I have the power and the weapons to take, and so I will take. And, and Paul takes us through there some of the descriptions here. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. And my time working with the military tells me that the military has not changed much from the time Paul is writing and saying, this is not the side of soldiers I want you to emulate. This is not the side of soldiers that I want you to copy. Not the orgies and the drunkenness. Sexual sins, sexual impulses, drunkenness and substance impulses. And then he goes on and says, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, where, where fights break out and where you have conflicts. About uh, 12 years ago, before 2CR was here, um, it was the first infantry division. They were deployed for, uh, it was one of those 12-month deployments in Iraq. The base was pretty much empty. It's just a quiet little town of village, uh, of Vilsec. And then thousands of soldiers got back from a deployment where they were at war and where they were forbidden alcohol and forbidden, I think, pornography, if, if I remember correctly. And then they come back. And that next month or two, it was like the little sleepy village of Vilsec was rocked. I mean, there were there were crimes, there were fights, there were the, the alcohol and 
all of that just went crazy around here to the point where the whole base was shut down. Soldiers were not allowed to leave Rose Barracks because of the shock of what was going on in that initial transition phase from not being able to be ruled by their impulses to coming back and restrictions being removed and them being allowed to be ruled by their impulses. And soldiers at their worst, but not just soldiers at their worst, people at their worst are ruled by their impulses. And, and the, the feeling is, if I just do whatever I want, I'm going to be happy. If I just say yes to myself, yes to what I want, yes to what I feel, yes to whatever is inside of me, that is the way to happiness, that is the way to freedom. Because freedom means saying yes. Slavery means telling yourself no. And so I wanna be free, I wanna enjoy life, I'm young, I'm invincible. Yes, yes, yes to everything I want, to, to all of my desires. And it doesn't even take a Christian to realize that that's not the way it works. Socrates, uh, Plato wrote The Republic, where Socrates is trying to describe what justice looks like and why justice is a good thing. And he's talking about the tyrant, the person who controls, the person who rules a, a city as a tyrant. And he says, he who is the real tyrant, whatever men may think, is the real slave and is obliged to practice the greatest adulation and servility, servanthood, to be the flatterer of the vilest of mankind. He has desires which he is utterly unable to satisfy and has more wants than anyone and is truly poor if you know how to inspect the whole soul of him. Moreover, as we were saying before, he grows worse from having power. He becomes and is of necessity, this is the person who says yes to all of their impulses, becomes and is of necessity more jealous, more faithless, more unjust, more friendless, more impious than he was at first. He is the purveyor and cherisher of every sort of vice, and the consequence is that he is supremely miserable, and he makes everyone else as miserable as himself. He uses a, a description of a gadfly, which I had no idea what it was, and so as I was reading through it, I was like, the heck is a gadfly? But I do, you know horses? You get horses and you get flies that bite them and all of a sudden they'll jump and all of a sudden they'll swat their tail or all of a sudden they'll take off running because the gadfly bites them and when the gadfly bites them, then they react to it. And, Without even the revelation of scripture, Socrates says these people who are ruled by their impulses, they're driven by the gadflies of their own desires. They're not free. They're not the ones who are happy. They're the ones who are controlled by this bite and that bite and this lust and that desire saying, do this, and they have to do it. It's saying, drink this, and they have to drink it. It's saying, smoke this, and they have to smoke it. They're always under someone else's control. We'd like to think, I'm in control. I'm drinking what I want to drink. I'm smoking what I want to smoke. I'm going where I want to go. I'm sleeping. I'm having sex with who I want to have sex with. And yet, they're not in control. I'm not in control when I live by my impulses. I am surrendering control to my own lusts and my own desires. And there are few things more disastrous, there are few dictators worse on you than you that will destroy your life and destroy your happiness more than your own desires. So as Paul is saying, you need to be soldiers, but you need to be soldiers that don't just aren't ruled by your impulses. Put on, in verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Because your flesh, your desires, my flesh and my desires will be the worst tyrant over us than we could ever imagine. Instead, we were just studying 1 Thessalonians 4 this morning in Sunday school. Very simply and very clearly it's laid out. The will of God is your what? Come on, those, some of you who are in Sunday school. Sanctification. This is the will of God for you. Even your sanctification. God's will is our sanctification. 
to, to live free from slavery to our lusts. To be able to say no to ourselves. To be able to deny ourselves. That opens us up to actually being free. To be able to, to determine, I am not going to be driven by the gadflies of my desires, by the gadflies of my lust. I'm not just going to wait, and when they bite, I jump. I'm going to have control over my life. I'm going to discipline myself, which is what soldiers are at their best. They are disciplined. They have self-control. They're self-sacrificial. God's will is our sanctification for us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, notice specifically, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't just say put on Jesus Christ, which is true, we should put on Jesus Christ. But what's the difference when he says put on the Lord Jesus Christ? What does that title mean, Lord? Master. And if God is the master, then what are we? We are servants. In order for Jesus to be Lord, you have to be servant. If you are not servant, then he is not your Lord. That's how that relationship works. So when we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, by the nature of what we're doing, we're saying, I'm going to find my freedom in servanthood to Jesus Christ. I'm going to find my freedom by kneeling to Christ. It's a it's a paradox that we become enslaved by saying yes to ourselves, and we become free by, by saying no to our desires, by saying no to our lusts that want to enslave us. So Christ as our Lord becomes an interesting picture, specifically at soldiers. So the next point there, at their best, great soldiers are ruled by great leaders. They're not ruled by their impulses. If you have an army and you lead an army into battle and the, the strategy for the battle is everyone do whatever comes to them in the moment. Each of us, we're going to go into it and whatever you feel like is the best thing to do, you do that and I'll do me and you do you and we'll all just kind of figure it out. Obviously, this is not a winning strategy for warfare. There, there needs to be someone who often is removed from the battle, who is watching the battle, and who can say, this is what you need to be doing, this is what they need to be doing, these people need to advance, these need to, people need to fall back. I, I enjoy, I'm kind of a, a history nerd, and so I read through biographies and I read through histories. And it's interesting, the, some of the most powerful armies in history have been ruled by leaders that the soldiers loved, the soldiers were committed to. You think about Alexander and his army. You think about Julius Caesar and his army. You think about Napoleon and his army. Everywhere Napoleon would ride, they would cry out, and I, I butcher the French, vive l'empereur, or something like that, right? That's beautiful. <laughs> The people of France sometimes liked Napoleon, sometimes didn't like Napoleon. But his soldiers loved him. That's why he could be sent off to, to exile, come back, and immediately have an army again. Immediately, everyone comes back and says, we'll fight for you again. There, there's a dynamic between a great army and a great leader where you, there's a love between them. And it becomes to be a trust of, I've seen you lead us into victory. I've seen your strategies defeat our enemies. And so whatever you tell me to do, I will do it with all my heart. Where armies will plunge into a battle because they believe in their leader. Because they believe in the person who is sending them into battle. And will fight with a bravery and a courage and a recklessness that you will not fight with if you're questioning your leader of does he or she know what they're doing? Are they, is this the right strategy? Is this the right battle? Do you see the spiritual parallels? It's hard not to, right? We have, our leader is Jesus Christ. So the whole idea is that he is supposed to be the one we love. He is supposed to be the one we trust. He is supposed to be the one we imitate. 
He is supposed to be the one whose orders we obey. And when he says charge, we charge with a fervor that says, I have seen him lead us in victory before, and I will follow him to death, because this is my leader. This is my captain. We get our ethos from our leader. I was reading a, a history of the Prussian army, and they were talking about the, the spiritual, the Lutherans, and then the Calvinists, and then the Pietists, and how the Pietists changed the ethos of the Prussian army. I thought, what does that mean, the ethos of an army? I had been familiar with the word ethos with, with rhetoric. You got um, logos and pathos and ethos. And ethos is like you listen to someone and you're convinced by someone because of who they are, because of their character. And who they are makes their speech more convincing. But how does that apply to an army? What is the ethos of an army? The ethos of an army is the character of an army, the habits, the conduct of an army. And we as soldiers, we get our ethos. Uh, our character comes from our leader, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to put on Jesus Christ. And we are supposed to love him, we're supposed to imitate him, and finally we're supposed to obey him. He is the one, you guys probably have someone in your life that you look up to and you think that person is doing it right. That person is the, is the soldier I want to be, is the teacher I want to be, is the father I want to be, is the mother I want to be. That person has got it right. That's the relationship we're supposed to have with Jesus Christ. The person we look to and say, that's what right looks like. That's what I want to be doing. That's what I aspire to be. We love him and we imitate him. But we also remember he is not just Jesus Christ. He is the what? Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Which means he gives orders and it means we obey orders. And his order is, is very clear. Two different times in John 13 as well as John 15. He says, I give you a new commandment. This is it. The Old Testament is filled with law upon law upon law upon law upon law. Jesus Christ says and comes and says, I'm going to leave you with one law. I'm going to leave you with one order for you to obey. And what was his commandment? Love one another. As I have loved you, you love one another. And then he said, by this, by your love for each other, everyone will know that you are mine. They will see your love, and your love will show them that you are Jesus followers, that you are Christians. Stop and think about that for a second. Jesus said the defining characteristic of a Christian will be love. Faith is absolutely important. We can't love without faith, without the Holy Spirit coming inside of us and turning us and changing us. But externally, you can't really see faith. You can't really interact with faith. What can you see? What can you interact with? Love. love. If you can't see love, if love doesn't act, then you've got to question whether it's really love. And Jesus left his disciples with this commandment, love one another. So whatever else Christians are, whatever else Christians stand for and do, it had better be love. Or else we are missing what our Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us. So if we, if we picket and we strike and we argue for, for all sorts of good things, and in the midst of all of this, we leave out love, are we doing it right? Have we got it? Christ, our Lord, our leader, said they will know that you are mine because you have the love that I have. They will recognize me through your love for each other 
through your love? Are we obeying the commandment? Paul addresses this in Romans 13. I almost forgot this is part of our text. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. We often think about John, the apostle John is kind of the apostle of love, and Paul is more the doctrine and the heart, and you know, Paul is hard-nosed, and John is this loving, soft, huggy apostle. And yet, what is the hard-nosed Paul saying here? All the commandments are summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. He left us a great commandment, and then there's another, uh, well, before we get to that. So, so you've got soldiers at their best. They're self-disciplined, they're self-sacrificial, they're brave, they're courageous, they're trained, they're elite forces who know what they're doing and know how to do it and are willing to sacrifice to protect others. But you could have the most elite, most highly trained, most competent unit in the entire military, and yet if they're not sent on a mission, if they stay in garrison and, and sit at home, will they make a difference in the battle? Will they make a difference in the war? Patronize me. No. I understand you could argue, well, maybe if people, uh, just, uh, no. If they're not engaged in the war, all of their training, all of their bravery, all of their self-sacrifice doesn't matter. And I think a lot of times that's the verge of where we get as Christians. We, we work on obeying God. We work on being uh, sanctified, on being set apart, and on, on loving God. But it's not just to be well-trained that God has called us. God hasn't just called us to train and train and train and train. God has called us to go, to get into the battle, to engage the war. There, there is a war and there are missions. And you can be as trained as you want, but if you never go on a mission, you're not going to change anything. You're not going to impact the battle. So the, the second thing... We not only get our ethos from our leader, but we also get our mission from our leader. Christ is the one. The Lord, Jesus Christ, is the one who has given us a command to love one another, but he's also given us a mission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because I'm leading to something. I hope that rings a bell. We're going to do a little test in a second. I hope that rings a bell. I hope when you hear that you say, hey, I, I've heard those verses before. I know what that's about. Paul absolutely knew what those verses were about. We're going to turn over to Romans 15 is, uh, in the second part here. Romans 15, I want to read 18 uh, to 29. Paul says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, meaning the, the believers in Rome. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped in my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. 
For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this, and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, and I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. You see, this is a soldier who is on a mission. This is not just a soldier who's like, I want to be a good person, and I want to love Jesus, and I want to go to church and sing praise songs. That's, that's the definition of my Christian life. It's to be a good person that loves God and, and goes to church. That's what Christianity is about. This is a soldier who understands there's a mission. There, there's a reason I'm training, and there's a reason I love God, and there's a reason he, he has called me. He hasn't just called me to sit around and, and sing and try to be good. He has called me for a reason to send me on a mission. And Paul was crystal clear about his mission. He said, I won't build on someone else's foundation. There, there's already believers here, so I'm going to go somewhere where there's not believers. There's already people here who are preaching the gospel. I want to go somewhere where there aren't people preaching the gospel. I, I think about this as our church. You know, we're in this transition phase, and Sunday after Sunday, we're saying goodbye to people as they go back to the States. And Sunday after Sunday, it's, not, it's exciting to see new families coming in and to see new people being brought in. And that, that's encouraging to me as a, as a pastor. However, the people that are visiting when they first get to Germany, those are usually people who some other church has already introduced to Christ's love and eternal life. And, and I'm so glad that Christians are looking for churches when they move to Vilsack. But our job is not just to find the Christians and give them a, a, a home when they get to Vilsack. There are also hundreds and thousands of unbelievers coming into the area. And our job is to find them and introduce them to Christ's love and eternal life. Our job is not just to, to see where the Christians will end up going to church. Christians have, have a duty to, to find a, a body of believers to be part of. That's, that's great and that's wonderful, but what about the unsaved? What about the people who aren't looking on the website for a church? What about the people who aren't interested in where am I going to worship when I get to Vilsack? How are we going to reach them? And I'm not preaching this yelling at you. I'm, this, is, this begins with me. I understand that. This is my weakness. This is my struggle. What am I doing? What are we doing to reach the people who aren't looking for a church? Our mission is to, is to introduce people, is to go and make disciples. And we've been put here for a mission. Do you know the mission, first of all? This, this was heartening, he says sarcastically. The Barnum Group does Christian uh, surveys. And they asked 1,000 Christians in America, have you heard of the Great Commission? And 51% of the Christians they asked said, no, I've never heard of the Great Commission. <coughs> another 25%, so 75%, another 25 said, yeah, I've heard of the word Great Commission, but I couldn't tell you what that means. I don't know what it means. And then we've got a, a whopping 17% that say, yes, I've heard of Great Commission, and yes, I know what the Great Commission means. Are we doing our job as Christian churches? Now, granted, there might be churches who are teaching the Great Commission who just don't use the term Great Commission. They might be teaching their people to go and make disciples without using the term Great Commission, and that's why statistics are hard to, to analyze. But this doesn't come out good no matter what, what you grant. Do we know what the, what the mission of the church is? Paul knew what the mission of the church is, but beyond just knowing what the mission of the church is, Paul knew his part in the mission of the church. He didn't just know we were supposed to do it. He knew what he was supposed to be doing to make that happen. So he said, he, he had plans, and he said, I'm going to come to you, and then when I come to you, I want to go to Spain. What are your plans? What are my plans? What are High Point's plans? What plans are we making to take part in the Great Commission? 
What part has God called you to play in the Great Commission? Are you a medic? Are you a support staff? Are you a frontline person? We've said over and over, and I want to repeat, it does not mean you have to go into missions in order to be part of the Great Commission. There are unsaved people all around us in Vilsack, Germany, in Grafenwehr, in Eschenbach, in Nuremberg. We, we have a, a ripe, plenteous harvest field right where we're at. In your unit, in your neighborhood, in your family, what part are you playing in the Great Commission? What relationships do you have where someone could be introduced to Christ's love and eternal life? I understand, even for myself, preaching this, there's this desire of saying, I want to. I want to know the Great Commission, of course. I want to be involved. I want to play my part. I want High Point to do our part. I want to be on mission. But it kind of feels like, yeah, but how do I even start that? How do I even take the first step? So when I leave church, I leave church saying, I should, but what should I do? What does that look like? How does that work? And there are a lot of answers to that question, but Paul gives us one more that is definitely worth reminding ourselves of. When he talks in Ephesians chapter 6, um, if you remember, he talks about the spiritual armor put on the whole armor of God, and he goes through the helmet, the breastplate, the gird your waist, and the feet, and all of that. You remember how he starts that illustration of the spiritual armor? It says, for we do not wrestle. Does that ring any bells? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers he says, this, this battle, your unsaved friend, your unsaved coworker, that is not the enemy. It is not a, a battle of Christians versus non-Christians. It is not a battle of Christians versus Muslims. This is a battle that is spiritual in nature. This is a spiritual battle that is going on. It is a battle of God against evil and God against Satan. So, so the warfare we carry on, it, it, it plays itself out physically, but primarily it happens and takes place spiritually. What kind of weapons do you use that are spiritual in nature? Look as he talks at the, right at the end. So he's just told them his plans. We went down all the way through verse 29 of chapter 15. And then verse 30. Uh, so Romans 15, 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me. And if you're like me, you're thinking, okay, by handing out tracts, by going and witnessing to your neighbors, if, if, you, if Paul wants them to, to battle with him, what's that going to look like? What does it look like to join Paul in his battle of the Great Commission, as he's carrying out the Great Commission. I appeal to you to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. <laughs> I think so often we overlook prayer. We talk about what we need to be doing in this spiritual war. We talk about the, the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And we start thinking strategies and we start thinking action plans and we start thinking what do we need to be doing. And one of the first things we need to be doing, perhaps one of the best things we need to be doing, is to strive in prayer. Notice he said strive together with me, again using military language. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. When he says fight, guess what word he uses? In Greek, it's agonizomai. Then in 1 Timothy 6, he says, I have fought the good fight. Again, agonizomai. Now, he's saying, strive together with me. In, and guess what word he uses? 
It's the same exact Greek word he's using to say, fight the good fight of faith. I have fought the good fight of faith. Fight with me in prayer. Fight with me in prayer. And it's so important that we agonize in prayer because this is where the the battle starts. If we don't agonize in prayer, we will fight the wrong battles. Again, the same word, agonizomai. When Luke describes Jesus praying in the garden, he said he prayed and he was in agony. He was fighting. And where were his soldiers? They were sleeping. And he woke them up. He said, this is the battle. I'm paraphrasing. This is the fight right here, right now. Pray with me. It's happening. It's it's going on right here, right now. Pray with me. And they fell asleep again. He woke them up again. Pray with me. They fell asleep. Then he wakes them up and he says, the betrayer is at hand, the time has come. And then what does Peter do? Now Peter is ready to fight. Now Peter sees the enemy. Now Peter says, it's time for action. I've got to fight for Jesus. Do you see what happened? The time for action had passed. The time to fight had passed. When when Jesus needed Peter, when Jesus asked for Peter to fight beside him, Peter slept and Peter slept and Peter slept. When Jesus no longer needed Peter's help, now Peter thought it was time to fight. Now Peter is grabbing his sword. Now Peter is swinging and attacking because he didn't know what was happening. He hadn't fought when the fight was happening and when the fight was over, now he's ready to fight. How many times are you and I like that? We don't pray. We're not connected. We don't know what God is doing. And then all of a sudden, we just impulsively start swinging our sword, thinking, I'm I'm serving you, Jesus. And I wonder if, if, like Peter, if Jesus doesn't often have to tell us, the time for fighting is over. You've missed it. You're fighting the wrong battle. This is not my battle. Go away. Put away your sword. You're doing this because you love me, but you don't know what you're doing. Because you have not engaged, you have not agonized in prayer. You've not spent time hearing me and talking to me. You've missed it. So so this is a step, when you walk out those doors, this is a step you can implement today. This is not just get involved in the mission of God and good luck finding it, figuring out what that means. Get involved in prayer. I think prayer is the best way to, to open the door for what is God doing and how does he want me to join him. Start praying. Start praying for your neighbors. Start praying for your coworkers. Start praying for your family. Start praying for our missionaries. Start praying for, for nations and peoples who don't Know God and do not have his word. Agonize in prayer with them. Fight a spiritual battle in prayer. And and I believe what's going to happen in my life and in our church and in your life is that the more we pray, the more God's going to open our eyes to where the battle really is and how we can actually get engaged in the battle. 